started here in just about 30 seconds. We're so happy you're here with us today. Welcome to our folks from Montana. We're here in Bozeman, and I know some of you are joining us from Bozeman as well. It's not snowing today. Our, uh, our picture here looks a lot like it did maybe what, what Dr. Snell, maybe two days ago it looked yeah. that snowy. Yeah. Great. All right, I think we're ready to get going. Welcome to today's live stream program with Streamable Learning and Museum of the Rockies. My name's Angie Weikert. I'll be your host for today's program. In just a minute, I'll introduce you to Dr. John Scanella. Dr. Scanella and I both work at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. As you can tell, like all of you, we are working from our homes. While our museum is temporarily closed to the public, we're excited to share with you the museum's collections from here at our house, in our houses. Before we get started, let's talk about a couple important things to know about the platform that we're using, Zoom. We have two areas to interact. One is our chat box that you've been using to let us know where you're tuning in from and what grade you're in. The other one is a Q&A area or question and answer area. If Dr. Scanella asks you a question that you want to respond to, you'll use that chat box that we've been using already today. Uh, if you have a question that you want to ask Dr. Scanella, go ahead and type that into the Q&A section. Sometimes our chat box fills up really quickly um, and I'll see your question better if you put it in the Q&A area. Uh, I'll go ahead and share those questions with Dr. Scanella, as many as I can get to today. Uh, we have more live stream programs scheduled. So this is the first of our Fossil Friday programs for the spring. Every Friday at, at 1210 Mountain Time or 210 Eastern Time through May 29th, we'll have Fossil, um, fossil Fridays or paleontology related programs here from Museum of the Rockies. So go ahead and visit museumoftherockies.org slash learn to see our full lineup of program and we are excited to continue learning with you all spring. Okay, I'm going to hide my video screen. You'll hear my voice throughout the presentation, sharing your answers and questions with Dr. Scanella. Uh, but now we're ready to get going, Dr. Scanella. So please help me welcome uh, Dr. John Scanella for a presentation on what it's like to be a paleontologist. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Angie, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us for this live stream today. We're going to be talking about what it's like to be a paleontologist. Uh, as Angie mentioned, we're streaming to you from near the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. So in case uh, anyone watching is not familiar with where Montana is, we'll just orient ourselves a little bit. Uh, got to find the button. Here we go. Yeah. So. Here's Montana in the northwestern part of the continental United States, uh, just south of Canada. If we zoom in a little bit more, um, the Museum of the Rockies is in Bozeman, Montana, uh, which is just north of Yellowstone National Park in the southwestern part of the state. And if we zoom in again, um, there, now we're outside the Museum of the Rockies. Uh, on a snowy day as it was a, a few days ago here. And uh, if you're standing outside of the Museum of the Rockies, uh, you are greeted by a, a large bronze cast of a big dinosaur. Uh, can anyone tell me what kind of dinosaur this, this is standing outside of the Museum of the Rockies? So if you have a response for Dr. Scanella, go ahead and type that into the chat box. We are wondering what kind of dinosaur this is outside of the Museum of the Rockies. Dr. Scanella, you're getting a whole lot of T-Rex. Ah, if you said T-Rex, you're right. This is a, a bronze cast of a, a T-Rex skeleton. It's nicknamed Big Mike, uh, and it stands outside of the museum. And inside the museum, there are the fossils of a lot of T-Rex and other dinosaurs and other fossil creatures in the paleontology department. And paleontology uh, is the study of ancient life, of creatures that lived a long time ago and how they changed over time. So part of that might be studying dinosaurs, uh, but paleontology is also uh, can be a lot more than just studying dinosaurs. Uh, some paleontologists might specialize in studying dinosaurs. I, I 
I uh, happen to spend a lot of time studying dinosaurs, but I also know paleontologists who love to study whales or ancient seals, ancient clams, ancient plants, uh, ancient dogs and cats, basically any creatures that might have lived on this planet a long time ago. Uh, if you're curious about them and want to make discoveries about them and learn more about them, that all falls under uh, paleontology. Uh, but for me, particularly, um, I've always been really excited about dinosaurs since I was a really little kid uh, growing up in New York. I remember going to the local library and looking at pictures and paintings and books uh, that looked something like this with these really weird looking animals that were called dinosaurs. And I remember seeing them and thinking, wow, these animals are so strange looking. They almost look like imaginary creatures like, like dragons or something like that. But I was amazed to learn that uh, these creatures had actually existed. They were real. And not only that, they had lived on this planet. And uh, not only that, but we could still today go out and find the remains of these creatures. And by studying these remains, learn more about uh, what they were like and what their world was like. And I, I thought that would be such a cool thing to be able to spend my time doing, kind of in a way, traveling back through time uh, to spend time with these strange creatures and learn more uh, about what they were like. Uh, and so the, the artwork you see here, these paintings were actually made over a hundred years ago. But when they were made, this was based on what was the current knowledge of dinosaurs at the time. Uh, we've since learned a lot more about dinosaurs in the last over 100 years. Uh, so for example, we now know that dinosaurs didn't drag their tails uh, on the ground like you see the dinosaurs here doing. Uh, here is a more recent reconstruction of, of uh, some dinosaurs in their environment. And I think that's one of the, the coolest things about uh, paleontology and, and science in general is that we're always making new discoveries, learning new things. And as we do that, we can kind of refine our view, get a clearer picture of what uh, the world was like in the past, what these creatures were like, uh, and how they lived. So it was something that I've uh, always been interested in uh, doing. So when I was in uh, college and deciding what to uh, what classes to take and what to study. Uh, paleontology is the study of ancient life, so it's kind of like a combination of two fields. Um, biology is the study of living things, and then uh, geology, the study of the earth. So paleontologists going through college and grad school often will focus on one of those areas or a combination of those areas uh, in studying paleontology. Uh, for me, I, uh, in college, studied geology, but also minored, took a bunch of classes in biology to get the combination of those uh, two classes. And then I came out to Montana State University here in Bozeman uh, for graduate school. And now I'm uh, the curator of paleontology, a paleontologist at the Museum of the Rockies. Uh, and so for me, as a paleontologist, uh, a typical year is basically divided into two main sections. Uh, the first part is the summer months of the year uh, where we go out and try to find new fossils. Fossils are the preserved remains of living things that are found uh, in the earth. So dinosaur bones would be fossils we might search for. Uh, and then the other part of that is when we get the fossils back to the museum and the lab and we can study them up close. Uh, but here, this is a view of uh, an area where paleontologists might spend a good part of the summer months. This is uh, the Hell Creek Formation in eastern Montana. These are rocks from the Cretaceous Age, where you might find, or the Cretaceous period, where you might find the uh, fossils of Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. Uh, and paleontologists going out into the field, we first uh, might need to get special permissions or, or uh, fill out special permits in order to go out and collect fossils to study. But once we do that, we can go out into areas like this and explore and look for fossils. Uh, and usually when we go out, we have certain questions 
that we might be interested in answering or, or uh, testing by finding fossils. Maybe we want to know what kind of dinosaurs lived in this area or how they were different from dinosaurs in this other area or how they changed as, as they grew up by collecting lots of fossils. But it's cool to be able to go out uh, each year to places like this and, and explore and make new uh, fossil discoveries. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time in eastern Montana in places like this, but I've also had the opportunity to uh, travel around the world looking for fossils. These are some pictures uh, from the field uh, in Mongolia, where I went uh, several years ago as part of an expedition to look for dinosaurs in Mongolia. And it was kind of cool to be able to be in Mongolia and uh, compare what dinosaurs there were like compared to dinosaurs here in Montana. Uh, so, so that's neat. So as a paleontologist, you might have the opportunity to uh, really travel the world uh, as you uh, try to understand how it's changed over time. But no matter where we go as paleontologists, when we get there, like this here is another picture of uh, the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. If we get to an area like this, one of the first things we have to do is collect a lot of data, uh, information about where we are, not just geographically where we are, like we're in Montana here, but also where we are in time. Because if you see in this picture here, you see this hill is made up of different layers of rock, different colored layers. And these layers of rock basically uh, represent uh, different layers of time. Uh, so the older rocks are at the bottom and the younger rocks are at the top of this hill. So if you walk up from the bottom of the hill to the top, you're walking up through time. And so if you were to find a dinosaur at the bottom of this hill, it lived at a different time than if you found a dinosaur at the top of the hill. So we have to collect a lot of information about where we are and take measurements to help us know exactly which layer of rocks we might be finding uh, a fossil in. So once we have a good idea of where we are, we, we walk around uh, looking for fossils. We might come across something that looks like this. Uh, these are uh, pieces of dinosaur fossils in the field. Uh, uh, this is, uh, does anyone have any idea or, or a guess of what kind of dinosaur this is here? Uh, it's broken into a lot of pieces. It's It's pretty difficult to to see what it is, but if you have any ideas of what this might be, this is sometimes what a dinosaur looks like when you first find it uh, walking around in eastern Montana. Any guesses on what kind of dinosaur this is? We have some responses coming in. If you've got a guess as to what kind of dinosaur fossil is in this picture, type that into the chat box. We've got a few responses coming in here, Dr. Scanella. We have Triceratops, Velociraptor, Velociraptor T-Rex, Trilobite, a skull, a Ceratopsian, Velociraptor. <clears throat> Some good guesses. Uh, so this is, this is a pretty tough one, uh, but this is actually part of a Triceratops, a big horn dinosaur that lived at the end of the uh, Cretaceous period. And it's been broken into a bunch of pieces. Uh, but at this site, we found pieces of the horns from above the eyes, the big, uh, the, the nose horn, the frill, the bony frill at the back of the skull of this Triceratops. So sometimes you might find a fossil creature and it can be kind of difficult to see what it is uh, when you first encounter it. But sometimes uh, a dinosaur might look a little bit better than that. The, here's another dinosaur that was discovered in the field and you see these little brown blobby things next to each other. Those are uh, caudal vertebrae, the, the bones of the tail of a big duckbill dinosaur named Edmontosaurus that also lived at the end of the Cretaceous period in Montana. And you might come across something like this, but even if you do, uh, it can be difficult to know, uh, is this, uh, if you dig into the ground here, is, is this just part of a tail preserved here? Is there an entire tail of this dinosaur here? Is there an entire dinosaur preserved here? Or are there a bunch of dinosaurs here? And the only way to really know for sure is to dig into the ground and, and excavate the site. And so that's what we spend a lot of time doing. 
Here's some pictures uh, of an excavation from just this past summer. We were working near uh, Ekalaka, Montana in the eastern part of the state and we we're excavating a triceratops skeleton. So in this photo, you can see the field crew uncovering the bones of this triceratops and these white blobby structures that you see in some of the photos, those are called field jackets. Uh, so uh, we will wrap the fossil bones in layers of burlap and plaster to make a cast around them, uh, which protects the bones so we can safely transport them back to the museum uh, from the field. And in the bottom left-hand corner uh, picture, uh, that's uh, Isabel and Richard, two students, and what they're doing there is they are mapping the bones, their positions in the ground, taking careful notes and, and drawing their position in the ground, which can help us learn a lot uh, about the site and about the animal and answer questions. Of, uh, here's some examples of some quarry maps from different dinosaur sites, some drawings of how they were arranged in the ground. So you can see in these two sites, the bones are kind of you know, scrambled about, uh, but it's important to collect this data in the field because it can help us later learn things like, was this dinosaur transported a long distance, maybe down a river, uh, or maybe did some big meat eater come and bite into these bones and throw them around a bit? So all kinds of things that we can explore by having this information about how the bones were arranged in the ground. Uh, and it's important to collect that while we're out in the field because once you take the bones out of the ground and take them back to the museum, you can't go back and then you know, really get the information about how they were arranged necessarily in the ground. So we collect a lot of uh, measurements and, and drawings and data when we're excavating the fossils and then eventually we might wind up with some big field jackets. Sometimes a jacket can be relatively small and you can carry it out of the field in your hand, but sometimes they're really, really big. Sometimes they're so big that we have to call in a helicopter to come lift up the field jackets and, and carry them to a flatbed truck, which will then drive them back to the museum. Once the fossils get back to the museum, uh, then they go to our fossil preparation labs, uh, where fossil preparators are the people who will open the field jackets and then carefully remove the rock that has encased the bones for millions of years. Um, and so there's lots of different career paths within paleontology. Um, you could work uh, as a museum curator, you could be a, a professor at a university, you could be a fossil preparator like we see here. Fossil preparators um, have, they need to have a lot of patience and attention to detail and really love uh, doing things like puzzles. If you really like putting together puzzles with lots and lots of pieces and many of the pieces might be missing, uh, then fossil preparation might be uh, kind of an exciting thing for you to do because uh, that's what fossil preparators do. Uh, and they have to be very delicate because sometimes the bones can be actually softer than the rocks around them. But in this uh, slide here in the lower left, you see a uh, part of the lower jaw of a triceratops that's being removed from the rock. And in the lower right, those are the horns of a triceratops that also is being removed uh, from the rock. But once the preparators remove all the rock and maybe piece together any broken bits of bone, then we can get a really good look at uh, uh, the fossils and some of them might go on display. This is the Hall of Horns and Teeth at the Museum of the Rockies. We're looking at a T-Rex skeleton in the front and some triceratops in the back. But only a small uh, percentage of the fossils at the museum can be on display at any one time. Most of the fossils at the museum are below this exhibit area in the paleontology collections areas. So if we were standing in the museum right now, let's now go down uh, below where these fossils are. Uh, here we are in the paleontology collections uh, and it's uh, rooms filled with rows and rows of cabinets and cases and shelves. And there are uh, staff at the, in the paleo department that work in the collections, the collections manager and uh, the collections assistants and their students volunteering. 
uh, and they catalog and track the fossils. They assign them numbers so that if a paleontologist comes and wants to study a particular bone or a particular dinosaur, we'll be able to uh, know where it is so we can bring it to them so they can study it. All this information is put into a computer database, database system uh, so that we can track the fossils. But it's estimated that in the paleontology collections at the Museum of the Rockies, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 400,000 individual fossils. And so at the bottom of the screen here, uh, we've opened one of the drawers in one of these cabinets. And these are bones from a duck-billed dinosaur named Brachylophosaurus. So now that they've been prepared, they're in the collections, we can take a closer look at some of the fossils in the collection and see what we can learn about some of these dinosaurs. So if we look at the uh, fossil in the lower right-hand corner of that drawer, let's take a closer look at that. Here it is. Uh, this is a dentary, the lower jaw, a lower jaw bone from a duck-billed dinosaur named Brachylophosaurus, which looks something like that. Uh, and if we look uh, closely at it, we see these lots of uh, interestingly shaped, diamond-shaped things uh, like this. Uh, these are actually the teeth of this Brachylophosaurus. Uh, some of them are still in the jaw. And duckbill dinosaurs have lots of little diamond-shaped teeth, and you see they're kind of stacked on top of each other. They have rows and rows of them. Some duckbill dinosaurs have hundreds of teeth, and they use these teeth for grinding up vegetation. So uh, Brachylophosaurus and other duckbills were herbivores. They ate uh, plants, and they did it with these uh, diamond-shaped teeth to help them grind up uh, the plant material. So just by looking at parts of the uh, anatomy of the skull, parts of it, the, the teeth. We can learn something about what this animal was doing. We can do similar things for other dinosaurs as well. If we open another drawer in the collections at the museum, uh, let's see what's in here. Ah, here's some more teeth uh, of another dinosaur. Can anyone tell me what kind of dinosaur these teeth might belong to? If you have a guess for Dr. Scanella, what kind of teeth we are looking at in this drawer at the Museum of the Rockies, go ahead and type that into the chat box. Go ahead and type in what kind of teeth you think you're looking at right now. Got some good guesses coming in. We have a lot of T-Rex, Velociraptor, a carnivore, Mosasaurus, Stegosaurus. T-Rex, Velociraptor, Allosaur, T-Rex, Tyrannosaur, Carnivore. Oh, there are lots of, lots of good guesses. So if you said uh, T-Rex, you were correct. These are the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex. In fact, they're the teeth of this Tyrannosaurus rex. And you can see they look very different from the duck-billed dinosaur teeth. Uh, these are much more, well, they're, they're bigger for one. Some of the biggest uh, teeth in that drawer are about the size of a large banana or bigger. Uh, they are uh, relatively sharp. They have little serrations on them, kind of like you might see on the edge of a steak knife. So just by studying the shape of the teeth of this animal, we can compare it to something like a Brachylophosaurus and see that these animals were eating different things. They were doing different things with their mouths. And so just by comparing their anatomy, the anatomy of these fossil creatures, uh, we can learn something about what they were doing. But uh, we can also compare this Tyrannosaurus rex maybe to uh, not just a duck-billed dinosaur, but maybe to another Tyrannosaur. This is the Spletosaurus, which is another uh, Tyrannosaur, kind of a cousin of Tyrannosaurus rex. The Spletosaurus also lived in Montana, but it lived in Montana about 7 million years or so before uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. So some paleontologists might uh, focus their studies on a particular group of, of animals or creatures or, or dinosaur, maybe tyrannosaurs in this case, and spend a lot of time comparing different uh, species of uh, tyrannosaurs to one another and seeing how maybe how they're related, how they might have evolved, uh, and all kinds of questions that we can answer just by comparing the bones of different specimens to one another. 
Another thing we can uh, look at by studying fossils that we bring back from the field is maybe how dinosaurs uh, grew up. So here is a fossil at the museum. This is the skull of a, a baby duckbill dinosaur named Hypacrosaurus. Uh, and so here's a, a little juvenile skull. And then here is the skull of an adult. And so the, the baby skull is, is looking to the right and the adult skull is looking to the left. And just by looking at them, we can see that uh, they look fairly different. They don't look exactly the same. The little one doesn't look just like the big one and the big one doesn't look just like the little one. One of the main differences you might notice between the little skull and the big skull is that the big one has this big crest on its head. Um, and in the little one, it's not there. It doesn't have uh, the big crest. And so it looks like this feature of the skull, the crest, is something that developed as this dinosaur grew up from a baby to an adult. Uh, so this dinosaur's skull changed shape as it grew up from a baby to an adult. And that's something that we see in lots of dinosaurs if we study their skulls. For example, here's the horned dinosaur Triceratops on display at the Museum of the Rockies, a bunch of them. And uh, you can see that uh, we're going from little Triceratops up to bigger ones on the right side of the screen. And as Triceratops grew up from a baby to an adult, its skull also changed shape. When Triceratops is little, the horns above the eyes curve backwards, but when it gets bigger, the horns begin to curve forwards. Uh, and at the same time, the little Triceratops you might see have these uh, very spiky spikes uh, around the uh, frill of bone at the back of the skull. Uh, but when Triceratops grows up, those spikes kind of flatten uh, down onto the edge of the frill. So by collecting lots of fossils of one uh, type of dinosaur, we can learn a lot about variation within that dinosaur uh, and maybe see things like how it changed as it grew up from a baby to an adult. And that can help us with asking and, and uh, exploring questions about uh, these dinosaurs. So with these uh, triceratops growing up from babies to adults, we might ask things like, well, why, why were their horns and, uh, and spikes changing shape? Why did triceratops have these horns and spikes? Uh, and some possible answers uh, could be that we see that lots of dinosaurs have these structures on their heads like horns and spikes and crests like we saw in the Hypacrosaurus. These may have been used for display. Dinosaurs might have been very interested in kind of visually communicating with one another, looking at the structures on each other's heads to help tell maybe who's who in dinosaur uh, society, because we see a lot of them having structures on their heads that change as they grow up. Uh, and you see something similar uh, in uh, living dinosaurs, birds, which display to one another, maybe with their feathers, which can be very Colorful. So these are some of the things that we can see and explore by looking at the outsides of the bones that might be collected uh, in the field. But also we can learn a lot about fossil creatures by looking inside their bones. So at the Museum of the Rockies, we have a paleohistology lab. Paleohistology is basically the study of the microstructure inside uh, the bones of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures. And uh, this is Ellen Therese Lamb, the histology lab manager at the Museum of the Rockies. And Ellen spends most of her days kind of cutting out pieces of the bones of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures. And she will cut out a piece of bone. And then in the upper left picture there, what she's doing is it's, the bone has been embedded in some resin and then she'll grind it down very slowly. Uh, she's holding a piece of bone over a spinning wheel that has kind of a, basically sandpaper, a gridded, gridded paper on it, uh, to grind down the bone until it's so thin that uh, light will pass through it, as we see in the upper right. And so once uh, we can get bone so thin that light will pass through it, then we can study it under a microscope. Uh, and down at the bottom of this slide here, that's uh, pictures of a dinosaur bone before and after 
a piece was taken out for histology studies. Uh, so Ellen will remove a piece of bone and then make a perfect uh, replica, an exact replica of it, and then put that replica back into the original bone where the piece was taken out. And then sometimes that can be painted to match the original bone color so that if uh, another paleontologist wants to still study this bone, they can still study the shape of the bone. But then we also have the information from uh, making a slide out of the piece of bone. So this is an image uh, inside uh, under a microscope of a, a piece of dinosaur bone. This is a part of a leg bone of a Myasaura, a big duck-billed dinosaur that lived in Montana in the Cretaceous period. Myasaura is actually the state fossil uh, of Montana. And you might notice uh, in this image, there's kind of lines going through this section of bone. I'm gonna highlight them for a second. Uh, these are called lines of arrested growth that we can see in some dinosaur bones. And these actually form annually every year. So if we count up the lines, it's possible to tell how old this animal was when it died. And so lots of studies looking at things like this have been done uh, with Myasaura. A lot have been done looking at uh, and counting these lines in little Myasaura, big Myasaura, medium-sized Myasaura, and then comparing them to one another. And through studies like that, it's been discovered, for example, that uh, Myasaura, this big duck-billed dinosaur, would hatch out of an egg that would fit in the palm of your hand, so not a very, not a very big egg. A little dinosaur would come out, and then it would grow to be almost uh, nine feet in length in just about a year or so. So these dinosaurs grew up really, really fast. And that's something that uh, has been discovered by looking inside their bones and studying them under the microscope. So in some cases, we can learn a lot uh, by looking inside the bones of dinosaurs and other creatures on top of also studying the outsides uh, of their bones. And so, uh, these are just some of the ways that we might study the fossils that are collected during the field season uh, and some of the things we can do to examine them. Uh, but all of this uh, all adds to our view of what the world was like in the past. And it's one of the things that I think is uh, most exciting about being a paleontologist and being a scientist is that it's, there's constantly new discoveries uh, being made. We're learning new things almost every day, uh, finding new exciting fossils each, each summer. Uh, new species of dinosaurs are being discovered all the time. And one of the exciting ideas about being, uh, in being a paleontologist is knowing that as much as we know now, as much as we've learned uh, over the last, you know, few hundred years or so, uh, that in 20 years, in 50 years, in 100 years, we're going to learn, uh, we're going to know so much more based on discoveries that haven't happened yet. So uh, maybe you uh, watching this or, or listening to me uh, might make some of these discoveries that will help contribute to cl clarifying our view of what the world was like in the past. Uh, and so that's kind of a, an overview of what, what it's like being a paleontologist, what I do as a paleontologist. And uh, uh, before, before we end uh, things there, uh, if you, as Angie mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to be talking about paleontology every Friday uh, with these Fossil Friday live stream programs. And so next week's program, uh, if you tune in on Friday at uh, 12, 10 Mountain Time, We'll be with Scott Williams, the uh, Museum of the Rockies Paleo Lab and Field Specialist. And Scott will be talking about uh, more in depth on finding and discovering fossils and then how we get them out of the ground and bring them back to the museum. And then what kind of tools and equipment we use to safely uh, prepare them out of the rock. So tune in next week uh, to hear from Scott about that. And then I'm happy to take any questions you might have uh, about being a paleontologist. Thank you, Dr. Snell. We have quite a few, so I'm going to try and um, get in as many as we can. If you want to keep your answer as short as you can, so we can go through as. Uh, okay, I'll be. I'll be. Um, 
a very popular one has been where do you find the most fossils which goes with where did dinosaurs live and are there any fossils in antarctica Okay, I will be a uh, short answer is dinosaur fossils have been found on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, uh, so they, they lived all around the world. And to find their, the fossils of dinosaurs, you wanna go to places where the right age rock to find dinosaurs is exposed at the surface of the earth. So Montana has a lot of uh, rocks from the end of the Cretaceous period, for example. So it's a great place to find T-Rex and Triceratops and dinosaurs like that. Uh, so lots of dinosaurs have been found in Western North America. Uh, there's lots of dinosaurs known from South America, China, uh, um, Mongolia has lots of fossils, They're all over the place. There's lots of good places to find uh, dinosaur fossils. Great, we had quite a few questions about your images of the, the dinosaurs and how we know their color and if their tails are upright for balance. Okay, uh, so it used to be thought that dinosaurs uh, might drag their tails, but uh, studies have shown that when we find dinosaur footprints, for example, it's very rare to find a, a tail drag mark. Uh, and there's also structures in some dinosaurs that would hold the tail up rigid off the ground. So, so we know that dinosaurs held their tail up probably to help with, with balance. Uh, especially in an animal like Tyrannosaurus rex, where your head is really gigantic, the tail might help with balancing. And you see that lots of colors in dinosaur reconstructions. Um, some of that is based on there's some actual uh, possible evidence for the colors in dinosaurs that have been preserved and discovered in, in recent years. Uh, examining structures under the microscope that might tell us what color some dinosaurs were. And so it appears that some dinosaurs may have been uh, quite colorful, uh, which is kind of exciting. And, and also if we look around at the dinosaurs around today, the birds, we see that they're, they're very colorful. So it makes sense that dinosaurs would also be very colorful, especially if they're kind of displaying to each other with things on their heads and, and things like that. Great. This will be our last question, but it's two part question here for you, Dr. Scanella, um, as we are going to wrap up. Okay. Um, why study fossils? Like, why do we study these fossils? Um, and kind of related is what's your favorite part about being a paleontologist and how long do you have to go to school? Oh, okay, that's a lot. Why, why study fossils? Well, uh, I would say uh, if you look outside today, you can see what life is like today, but if we want to know what life was like throughout the entire history of the planet, then we have to go into the fossil record to study life over the course of the millions of years uh, in the past uh, to see how life has changed through time. Uh, why study fossils? What was the next part of the question? The next part about the question to wrap up on your presentation on being a paleontologist. What's your favorite part and what, what kind of schooling do you need? Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, for schooling, uh, I personally uh, went through high school, got a bachelor's degree in college in ge geology and uh, also studied a lot of biology and then went to graduate school and got a PhD in earth science. Graduate school is where you can really specialize your studies on a particular group. I studied the horned dinosaur Triceratops. And so my favorite part about being a paleontologist is really two. Uh, going out into the field and discovering new fossils is always very exciting because you might be the first person to ever see those, those fossils. And then when you're back in the lab and can kind of test ideas about what, what you're seeing, that can also be very exciting to learn new things about the fossil creatures. Great. With that, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your Fossil Friday. Um, we'll have these programs, um, like we said, every Friday through May 29th. You can go to museumoftherockies.org for more information and for our registration links that we'll have up early next week. Um, and if you enjoyed this one, you may also join us for reptiles live stream programs um, as early as next Thursday. Visit us at museumtherockies.org slash learn. Dr. Scanella, thanks so much for joining us today. And we hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Happy Fossil Friday. Thanks, everyone.